Okay, welcome back to the technology room, everybody. Uh, we've been some interesting presentations so far, but we're we're running a little bit behind, so we're going to get racing straight into the next one. We've got Cameron Ball from Moodle HQ, and he's going to give us a a rundown on the, the wide-eyed, crazy functional programming, uh, which covers a bit of philosophy uh, and the age of parallel computing. So. Any questions, put them in the forum. If we can't get to them now, we will get to them. Uh, but for now, it's over to you, Cameron. Yeah, g'day, uh, I'm Cameron from Moodle HQ. I work on the Moodle Cloud team and I'm here presenting what I think may be the first talk at a Moodle Moot that's actually not about Moodle at all. I mean, it's tangentially related. It's about programming. Um, I originally wrote this as a personal project and I presented it internally at Moodle HQ and it was so well received that um, everyone was like, hey, do you want to do it at the Moot? So yeah, why not? Here I am. Um, so let's get into it. Right, so this first slide is intended to uh, get your brain sort of a bit activated. We've got a bunch of fun little facts and anecdotes here. Um, we'll just go through a couple of them. We'll go through all of them. It was intended to be sort of like a lobby while people join the chat. And there's a good one. All of Back to the Future happened in the past. Maybe we'll just go through two or three of these to get the, the brain fully, fully engaged, the cortex fully engorged. And everything is in the future. It's a very profound quote. And we'll go for one more. That is a good one. Functional programming and procedural programming are owed to these two pre-Socratic philosophers. I encourage you to look those guys up because they're pretty cool. All right. So let's get into it. This is the talk called Wide-Eyed Crazy Functional Programming. Um, and yeah, there's me, Cameron, Middle Cloud Developer, and of course, some fun animations because you cannot spell functional without fun. And I need this slide here just to let the confetti settle because otherwise the next slide chugs even more. Um, and so when I first presented this, a few people were curious about the title and I imagine a bunch of people out there are curious about the title. So I thought I'd come up with a slide to clarify what it means. Going to take it. There we go. So this is, this is figure 1.1, what most people consider a typical functional programming advocate bit of an eccentric crazy and they spout these nonsense words like monads, applicative functors, lambda calculus every few seconds and often they don't have very much hair. And of course before we get too far into it I want to I want to add a bit of framing to the talk. Um, my goal here is actually not to teach you functional programming. What I want to do is get you curious. I want to get you longing for more. And, um, you know, every good talk has an obligatory quote, and here's mine. I think it really uh, helps convey the framework I used when writing this lecture. Um, if you wish to build a ship, do not divide the men into teams and send them to the forest to cut wood. Instead, teach them to long for the vast and endless sea. So that's my, that's my goal here. I want to get you to vast for the long and endless sea of not just functional programming, but um, programming in general. There's, there's lots out there to learn, and, you know, some people don't even bother learning about the other stuff there. So... Um, yeah, and we can't forget attribution because that way everyone knows how cultured you are and how many important things you've read in your life. And I actually don't know who said that. I'm not cultured. I'm Australian. Uh, I'm really sorry. Um, and with this framing in mind, I'd like to encourage you not to take any of the code examples in here too seriously. There's not many. Um, they're mostly to demonstrate big picture ideas. So what is this talk about? And I'm going to commit a cardinal sin of teaching, and I'm going to tell you things it's not about. It's not about Haskell, and it's not about convincing you to stop using whichever language you like, um, and it's not about mathematics. Um, when when trying to explain things, there's lots of perspectives you can try slice that from, and for this this talk, I've gone for a very meta perspective, which is perspective itself. Um, as I said, it's not a talk about Haskell. It's about viewing programming through different perspectives. And it's broken up into three sections, I think. I think it's three sections. Um, I'm going to pause for a bit of each section. And when I do that, I'll encourage people to write questions in the forum. I'm not going to answer questions at the end of the talk because, like I said, we're short for time. And it's just better if I can go to the forums and answer them there. Um, so, yeah, let's, let's get into it. What is functional programming? 
There we go. Profound. It is programming with functions. Really, everything is a function, um, which does beg the question. Come on, change the slide. What is a function? Now, you know, I assume a bunch of people watching our programmers and they've heard of functions before. Um, but functions in the functional programming context are a bit different. What a function is, is a mapping between two sets that associates every element of the first set to exactly one element of the second set. Um, this is different to functions in procedural languages. And the, the name function is a bit of a misnomer in that context, I think. They should have been called procedures or subroutines. And that's actually why those languages are part of the procedural programming paradigm. Um, a function, a, a true function, is a mapping. You can think of it similar to a, an array in PHP. Like, you know, if you have an array in PHP, it associates the keys to values. So say you have a key, a uh, note, Jeff, and it points to the string, hello. Um, you can have another key, uh, maybe Chef, that points to the string, hello. That's fine. But you can't have Jeff point to two values um, and a pure function is exactly like that and in the same way a php array can't do anything except express a mapping a pure function can't do anything express a mapping you can't mutate state um, and as i just mentioned those are what's called pure functions uh, and there's a good chance that i'll just say functions for the rest of the talk because i forget um, and this has some very interesting consequences in a functional, in a purely functional programming language, we have no equivalent constructs for for loops, while loops, go tos, variables, and probably a bunch of other things. Um, a little asterisk on the variables there because you can actually have variables, but it's in the uh, mathematical sense. You can say like x equals three, and that means they are one in the same. Um, you should be able to substitute x for three anywhere in the program, um, and you can't change it, unlike in a procedural language where you can reassign the value whenever you wish. Now, this uh, <laughs> this begs the question, who in their right mind would want to do that? So I'm, I'm here trying to convince you functional programming is awesome because it has less features. Um, that is true, it does, but it actually doesn't make any difference. You can accomplish anything in a functional programming language that you can in a procedural language. Um, and yet, why? Uh, the best answer I can give to that question is learning is good. And this is where it ties into Moodle. We're all about education, so we should be all on board with learning new things. Um, and this brain plasticity idea, learning learning functional programming for someone who, you know, has spent a lot of time doing uh, procedural style programming, it's going to cause you to, it's going to require you to wrestle your brain into shapes that it's never taken before, which is a really good skill to develop. It's going to leave you with this plasticity to learn a greater variety of things we encounter in life. And it's also going to make the maths uh, cortex of the brain very, very buff. I said there's no maths in this talk, and there's not. But if you do decide to go on a, a functional programming pilgrimage, you will get a buff maths brain. Um, and it helps with communicating as well. Functions, sorry, programs written in the functional style are actually easier to communicate to people um, than programs written in the procedural style. But of course, that relies on the other person speaking the same language as you. Right, um, so this is the section on paradigms. Uh, I, I was going to pause here for questions, but I don't think anything I've said so far is particularly uh, controversial. Maybe it is, but I'm going to soldier on here just for the interest of time. Um, so in particular, uh, I want to talk about the two most widely used programming paradigms, uh, and they are the two that are at the most at odds with each other, actually. So we have the declarative paradigm and the imperative paradigm. And inside those, we see sub-paradigms. And there are ones that sit outside of those. Like, for example, SQL is a declarative language, but it is not functional. Um, and assembly is an uh, imperative language, but it's not procedural. You can't, you can't have procedures if you write assembly. Um, although the vast majority of imperative languages are indeed procedural. And then it, inside the, the inner boxes, we see some examples of languages that uh, are written with that paradigm in mind. Um, so for the purpose of the talk, it's probably OK to just think of declarative and functional uh, as interchangeable and imperative and procedural as interchangeable. And there's a very good chance I'll mess that up as I go through the talk. So what's the purpose of this diagram? 
uh, we're going to do our first uh, pers ah, perspective change. Uh, some people might have realized that those are both words used to describe human languages, and that's relevant because learning a new paradigm is beneficial uh, in the same way learning a new human language is. Um, and so I've rewritten this as if I was a linguist um, and what those words actually mean. So declarative is a sentence which expresses a statement of fact, something like he runs, I like climbing, ice is cold, Taylor Swift is going to go on a date with me one day. I messaged her on MySpace a few years ago, just waiting for her to get back. Taylor, if you're watching, uh, my email's at the end of the, the video. And then in imperative, we have a sentence which expresses instructions or requests. You know, shut the door. Don't eat my burger. Let's go to the pub. Don't hit on Taylor Swift. Um, and I, I imagine you can see the similarities with, with um, imperative programming there. Like it's a clear set of instructions to follow. And here's just... If you remember nothing else, this is this is how you remember them. Declarative is this is this. Imperative is do this. Um, and when you think about programming, as I explained with the functional paradigm, we lose our instructions word instruction words. We lose the for while go to variable reassignment, all that stuff. And that brings us to one of the first big brain moments in the talk, which is programming languages are human languages. We do not write programs for computers. We write them for other people to read. And so, okay, why is this declarative thing good? Because surely in both cases, the human language case and the programming case, we learn something useful. We, we learn the ability to instruct people to do things. Like, surely that's useful. How do you do anything if you can't instruct people or computers? Um, here is one thing that we gain in the imperative style we gain sorry the declarative style we gain a temporality and that is something being independent of or unaffected by time so a declarative program expresses what it actually does it expresses things in terms of relationships in an imperative paradigm thinking about the program means thinking about changes over time so think about your, your loops you got your variables in your loops and you've got to keep track of what's going on over time in your head um, but in a declarative paradigm, you just think about relationships. You look at something, at what something is and how it relates to the other things around it, and then you move on with your life. And it's a bit of a weird idea, but it does actually uh, end up giving you more brain space to focus on solving the actual problem. You're not tracking all these things going on all over the shop. So, why? Again, um, there's some reasons you can read them. Um, I'll say that some problems are simply very difficult to solve in the imperative way. And that's especially true when you're talking about events that might be happening in parallel and may run at different speeds on different executions of the program. Um, something that comes to mind is JavaScript. If you ever used JavaScript in the days before promises, you would have run into huge amounts of pain making requests to get data or something. And you've got, you know, variables to try and track which one finished first and this sort of thing. You just you get yourself in a mess really, really quick, and you can come up against data races just by virtue of the way the program is expressed. And there's a little quote there that I really like, constraints liberate, liberties constrain. That's a fun one to think about. And yeah, at this point, I imagine a lot of you people are thinking, enough of the philosophy and linguistics mumbo jumbo. Let's, uh, let's see something interesting. So uh, here's a code example. Uh, this is no particular programming language. It's one that I just came up with, although it does look like uh, many languages that are out there. Um, and this is a really interesting example because these two snippets of code behave differently depending on which paradigm you interpret them with. So in the declarative paradigm, this code, the x equals x plus 1, will hang and not complete execution, um, whereas in the um, imperative paradigm, it runs. And this code will run in the declarative paradigm, but it will hang in the imperative one. And we'll explore that a bit more in the next slide. So here we are. We're going to just interpret it using English. Um, so in the declarative paradigm, we say x is the same as itself plus 1, which d it doesn't make sense. That's no good. It does, does not compute, right? Whereas in the imperative paradigm, because it's a set of instructions, we say evaluate the thing on the right of the equal sign, then store it in the thing on the left of the equal sign. And that's a list of instructions that can be followed, and it makes perfect sense. This one, in the declarative style, we read that as the repeat of x 
is x appended to the repeat of x, which if you think it through, that's just an infinite list of x's, uh, of whatever x happens to be. In the imperative paradigm, we evaluate that as, we interpret that as, to evaluate the repeat of x, which I spelled wrong, um, first evaluate the repeat of x. So there's obviously a recursion problem there. We can It's defined in terms of itself, and the instructions can never be followed because they just cascade out forever. And again, I'll just reiterate this. Programming languages are human languages. Uh, the, the parallels there are really, really cool. Imperative tells you what to do. Declarative tells you what things are. And here's some actual code that you can run if you have uh, Haskell installed or something like that. Uh, this is Haskell syntax. The double plus is the concatenation operator. And this is the exact same as the definition I showed before. And you read this as three Fs is the first three elements in an infinite list of Fs. And that's completely fine. If you have an infinite list of Fs, of course, you can just take the first three. It's no problem. It's a shame that the function name is take because that feels a bit like an instruction word. But, you know, whatever. No one's perfect. By contrast, in the JavaScript version, we interpret this as first compute an infinite list of Fs. And can't do that. Right. So that's pretty cool, I think. Uh, because we can express what things are, we can express an infinite list in, in a declarative language. Um, and none of the declarative stuff relies on tracking changes anywhere. We just need to know what the thing is and how it relates to other things, and we move on with our life. And we've gained the ability to wield infinity, which is pretty cool. That's something that you have to worry about a lot when programming things cascading out of control, but no, nah, it's not a problem anymore. Right, so this is the next section about promises. I'm going to, I'm doing pretty good for time, so I'm going to pause for two minutes if anyone wants to write questions in the forum while what I just spoke about is fresh in your mind, please do so. And after the talk, I'll, I'll go through and I'll answer those. Um, while we wait, I'll just go back to this guy and we can we can look at some of his little, little quotes. Yeah, if you can be disgruntled, can you also be gruntled? That's a good one. There's more stars in our galaxy than there are atoms in the universe. That one blew my mind when I first realized it. And 0.9 recurring is exactly equal to 1. A lot of people dislike that, but it's true. That's a really fun one about English spelling. If you look at other words where those letters appear, you can see that it produces the word fish. And one of the facts is a complete fabrication, and it would be very unfortunate if it was this one. This is interesting. So yeah, if you sift through Pi, your credit card details are somewhere there. And I'm pretty sure that's actually how scammers get credit card information. They just sift through Pi looking for valid credit card details. That's how I do it anyway. And 1729 is the best number. I checked every number, and that is the best one. Uh, I'll probably wait for another 30 seconds and then move on. It's very strange not getting feedback during a talk. I don't really know if people are ready to, to proceed or or what. And the secret, uh, just We're drink. Cracking up. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I actually ate a banana before doing this talk, just to get a bit bit more strength. Buff brain. Uh, we're back at the start of these, so okay, I'm gonna continue back where we left off. We're in the section. Oh wait, hang on, no, we're not. We're in the section about promises. Um, JavaScript promises. That seems like a bit of an odd tangent. Why am I talking about JavaScript promises? But let's go with it. And I'm going to break the, the cardinal rule of teaching again by telling you what promises are not. Promises do not make things asynchronous. Um, there's a lot of misleading information out there that seems to indicate that they do. Um, you can have perfectly synchronous promises, uh, but the thing the thing you pass as a callback to a promise does not get like run in the background or anything like that. So I just wanted to get that out the way. Um, and this is this is what promises really are. Uh, they solve these these problems. They solve asynchronous request management, error handling for computations which may fail, and probably a bunch more stuff that I forgot. And so what are they? A promise is a value which may or may not be available yet. That's where the asynchronous part comes in. That value might come in later, uh, wrapped in some additional context. And some functions to instantiate the wrapper. In this case, we've got promise.resolve and promise.reject. 
and a rule for composing the wrapped values, which is uh, the then method. Now let's have a quick uh, JavaScript recap, because I'm going to be using this notation. Um, that one at the top, the x with the arrow, is equivalent to that function definition. And what is composition? It's a method for combining two things of the same type into another thing that is also of the same type. And just a quick note on that, um, I'm sure a lot of you have come across function composition. There's many different kinds of composition, but function composition is very common, especially in programming. Um, however, in this example, we're talking about composition of promises in the sense that we combine two promises and get another promise. Right, so promise composition. Um, the then method of a promise accepts a function as an argument, and this function takes a value and returns a new promise. The new promise combines the previous two using the composition rule that you pass into then. So I, I hope it's not too small. Um, in this snippet above, there are three promises. So there's the first one. We've got just promise.resolve some value. And this is a completely synchronous promise because the value is there immediately. And then here, this thing itself is a promise. It's the composition of the first one. And then it uses the composition rule x plus and another value to produce a new promise using the value from the previous one. And then the third promise is the composition of all three. So this function here is using this composition rule with the promise that was composed back here. So you end up with a promise with the value some value and another value and another one. And this here still results in a promise. This is slightly different. We have a reject in here. And the way that works is any subsequent call to then just leaves you with the rejected promise. So we just end up with a failed promise with the value. It's all gone wrong. So this is what I mean when I was talking about um, computations that may fail. It gives you a nice, elegant way to handle that. Like, you know, maybe the request times out or something like that. Right. So, yeah, why did I show that? Who cares? Um, what we're doing there is we're declaring how we want the promises to compose. And we've come up with a system where the order that the promises actually resolve their values in is no longer important. And in other words, the timing aspect is gone and we can declare failures anywhere in the chain. So th those words are sure starting to sound familiar. And this is one of my favorite things. This is uh, JavaScript code and this is Haskell code and they look so similar. So if I hover over this, you can see the, the symbols that correlate. Um, in Haskell, we have this thing, it's called, it's called either, it's called the either type. And instead of promise.resolve, they have right. And instead of promise.reject, they have left. But this example, we're using just right. So promise.resolve, we start here, that's the same. Then this funny little arrow guy here, that's the same as then. And this is just the Haskell way of making like an inline function, promise.resolve. And then we're doing string concatenation there. And I mean, just, they look so similar you'd think one copied the other but it's not true they, they it's an independent um thing like that emerged in both languages um, and here's the the failure case we've just chucked a left in there so in the top one we get a failed promise with oh no's and in the haskell one we get a left with oh no's um so <laughs> if you've ever used javascript promises you've been doing declarative style programming all along without even realizing it and yeah, we get some new superpowers here. We can write atemporal code, um, which explains why promises emerged in JavaScript. It's a place where people are constantly dealing with requests that may finish in any order. And so I think it's so cool that people using a language so far removed from Haskell ended up solving the problem in pretty much the exact same way. And like I said, they're independent discoveries. There's no, no plagiarism going on here. Uh, but I don't think it's a coincidence that they appeared in JavaScript given the nature of, of the language and the ecosystem. Right, uh, this is the section on composition, and I'm doing pretty well for time, so uh, if you've got questions about about that, feel free to go chuck them in, in the forum, and I guess we'll just go back to the little, little dancey guy again. I think we've seen all the facts, but whatever, you can watch them again. Try find the fake one. I should have bought a Rubik's cube or something. I could like solve the Rubik's cube while while waiting. At least that would have been entertaining. This one's cool. 
23 people in a room to ensure a 50% chance of a shared birthday. Tim has put something in the chat. Um, he said, it's much easier not to have bugs when your functions don't have side effects. And yes, that's very true. Entire classes of bugs simply cannot exist in a purely functional programming language. Give it another 30 seconds or so. That's a fun one if you're into languages. Preservative means something different in many European languages. For the European viewers. All right, let's kick on. Right, this is the section on composition. Uh, I mentioned it a bit in the previous section, but this is sort of composition in a more abstract philosophical sense. So here's a quick explanation of what composition is. Um, again, very abstract. So say you have three things. They can be anything, but in this example I'm using coins. And say you have some arrows. In this case I'm using pipes, coins and pipes, because video games. So if, if you can go from there to there, from A to B, and if you can go from B to C, then the composition of those two things, if it exists, which it's not guaranteed to, goes from A to B. Pretty straightforward. I think, like you can see from the diagram, like obviously if this is a system where composition is possible because you just go in that pipe, in the other pipe, and you're at C. So yeah, of course, if we compose those things together, we get a route from A to C. Right, who cares? What's, what's so great about composition? What's great about it is that big problems can often be chopped up into smaller problems that are easier to solve. And if we can be clever about how we like dice up the problems, um, we can come up with solutions to the individual pieces such that we can put the solutions together and form a full solution. And then, this is the cool part, you can infinitely speed up the work by simply adding more workers. You get them to work in parallel, right? So I'm just going to go back to that diagram. So yeah, maybe we want to go from A to C. Maybe that's our goal, to go from A to C. But that's like really hard for some reason. But maybe someone out there worked out how to go from A to B and someone else worked out how to go from B to C. Well, if we're working inside of a system where composition is possible, then we just solve the problem. You just compose the two solutions together, and you're done. And uh, this is, I think, the natural way humans solve problems. We love to you know, divide problems up in our heads and then figure out the little bits and, and put it all back together. Uh, okay, uh, here's some examples throughout history of where composition was employed. Um, the pyramids, you know, they had lots of people working in parallel to, to move those blocks. It wouldn't make any sense to just get one guy to move every single block. The Large Hadron Collider is a great one. I don't think there's a single person in the world who fully understands how that thing works. That was a huge collaborative effort. McDonald's. Um, I think McDonald's was the first place to have staff make individual parts of a burger and then at the end compose the burger together and that way they could produce way more burgers instead of just having one one guy at the grill making the burgers. And uh, Moodle does it as well uh, when, we, when we do projects. So let's have a think about how Moodle tackles projects. Um, so do we get one mega awesome 10 times developer to bash out all the features a little bit like this? Uh, no, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be keen to work with someone with that sort of attitude. So the correct way to write software is of course with your friends as a team. So this is why it's worth uh, spending the time to plan how to chop up the work. And we need to make sure we're chopping the thing up into pieces that be, can be put together later. And this is why uh, at Moodle we spend all this time planning how we're going to do the work for the releases. And um, yeah, this is a takeaway. I, I believe composition is nature's greatest hack. Uh, I wanted to try and convince you that it's fundamental to the way humans think. Uh, we're amazing for our ability to do this. Uh, I don't know if there are other animals that break up problems this way and then solve them collaboratively. I think we're the only ones that do it. And so at its core, the composition is about relationships and building complexity by combining the relationships. And hey, that sounds familiar again, doesn't it? That whole declarative thing, that was about relationships. So this brings me to uh, 
one of well, we're near the end. My final point, more or less, is that when we write programs as an individual in this case, um, we naturally want to break up the problem. That's why we have functions in programming in the first place. We don't write, you know, like one big program that's like a novel essentially. We want to break the problem up into building blocks that we can put together and mix and match. And the building blocks you use matter. Some compose better than others. Um, now, because of all the restrictions the functional paradigm places on you, the lack of mutation, the lack of control flow, functions in a pure language naturally, uh, well, they're not well suited, they are, they're guaranteed to be composable. So I'm just going to go back to that composition slide. So say we have some function that goes from A to B and it has a side effect. That means when you call B to C with the result from A to B, that is not necessarily the same as calling the composition of those two functions a to c the whole point of the composition is that if you call a to b then b to c that the result should be the same as calling the composition of them but if the if the database is mutated or something like that in one of the calls those two subsequent calls to the composition or the one after the other version will have different results the point of composition is that they should be the same and in a purely functional language they will be they're guaranteed to be there's no way you can mess it up um, and I'll, I want to make a comment that I think is my opinion. I don't know the history of these things, but I'm, I'm pretty sure procedures in imper what we call functions, um, in like PHP, for example, are a short-sighted attempt at composition. It's like people wanted a way to have these building blocks. They wanted a way to nicely put things together, but it doesn't quite work unless you're very disciplined and you try to keep the side effects out of your functions. But as I said, in uh, pure language, you can't have the side effects. You just cannot have them. Uh, it's guaranteed that you have composable building blocks. And yeah, final little box there. This is becoming super relevant in the age of parallel computing, um, which I'll touch on in a second. Um, here's a little bit about why functional programming is awesome, the thing that I wanted to convince you of to begin with. So by taking away these convenient but dangerous tools, like the ability to just mutate state, to modify the database, whatever, um, we're left with tools that are incredibly powerful, but more difficult to wield. In particular, we've got atemporality. We can express things independent of time. We've got infinity. We, we've managed to wrestle infinity. And we've got composition, the fundamental way human solve problems is now just available at all times. You don't have to worry. And here's a couple of final big brain thoughts. Um, at Moodle, we work across multiple time zones. So it's, you know, the idea of being able to solve problems in a time independent way seems a bit appealing. Um, and Moore's law, this one is particularly interesting. Uh, for those that don't know, that's the observation that the number of transistors in CPUs is doubling every year, but that's finishing now. It's, um, it's coming to an end. We can't physically cram more transistors in there. And we're now seeing a shift to parallel computing because we, you know, you want more, you want to double the, the power, you just add another box. I mean, imperative paradigms are not the right, the right tool for programs that need to run across multiple computers. They're just not. Um, so either I think we'll see a shift to declarative style programming soon, but that, you know, functional programmers have been saying that since the dawn of time, or we're going to shoot ourselves in the foot and make it hard real quick, real fast. And yeah, I hope we see the, the paradigm shift because it's the definition of madness, really, isn't it? Like, if you do the same thing over and over again but expect different results. And another analogy that comes to mind when I think about these things is like the, the frog in boiling water. Well, he's not in boiling water. He's in cold water, but the water temperature slowly rises so he doesn't notice. And then eventually he's just cooked. We're, we're getting to boiling point. we gotta, we got to jump out of that pot soon. Um, and here's a really fun one. Quantum mechanics might be so confusing because at a certain point, the universe doesn't want to be chopped up anymore. Like, you know, we kept splitting things. We split the atom and then we got like electrons and we started looking into those. And then after a little while, physicists were like, oh, this stuff's starting to behave real weird. I don't like it. And maybe it's the case that we just can't understand that. Our brains want things to be chopped up into small pieces. But does the universe have any obligation to actually be that way? I don't think so. And, um, yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you so much for watching my talk and letting me share my passion for programming with you. Um, if nothing else, I hope you're a little bit more curious about functional programming. And even though it's not super relevant to Moodle or, you know, probably the kind of code that, that you people write on a daily basis, um, 
I really would encourage you to investigate it because learning more about it will help you be a better programmer. If you have questions, please email me. I'm always, always happy to talk about this. And I would suggest going to the pub for a drink, but, well, uh, yeah, COVID-19 has other ideas about that. And if you have ideas about how I can improve this presentation, as I said, it's a personal project, please get in touch. I, I'll be very happy to, to take on um, any, any constructive criticism. So, yeah, I'm going to mute my mic now, otherwise we'll get echo from Chris. But thank you very much. I'll be on the forums answering, answering your questions. Well, Cam, what can I say? That was uh, very fascinating and uh, even a slightly bit entertaining as well. So thanks for that. I learned a lot about how to make a hamburger and I also found out how many uh, credit cards you might find in a pie. Um, oh, and I forgot to tell you that I did see Taylor Swift last night and she said to pass on your, her regards. So regards. Righto. All right, everyone, we've got a bit of a break now before the next one. So uh, head down to the cafe and have a coffee or a cerveza or whatever tickles your fancy. And we'll see you back in the tech room uh, in about 20 or 40 minutes. Thanks a lot.